Welcome to The Marketing Remix, presented by Red Door Interactive. I'm Reed Carr, CEO of Red Door Interactive. Our show is a senior level marketer's resource for navigating our ever evolving landscape. In each episode, in about 20 minutes, experts from different marketing disciplines representing different buyer touch points tackle one important marketing topic. Then, what do you need to know and how does it affect the buyer? Welcome to this episode, which is what the f- is WCAG? From PPC to CRM to KPIs and CRO, the marketing industry loves its acronyms. But here's one acronym marketers might not yet be familiar with. WCAG, also known as Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, like the name implies, WCAG is a step-by-step set of technical requirements that allow your website to be accessible to everyone, including those with disabilities. In other words, if your brand has a website or an app, then the rules of WCAG affect you. In this episode, we'll discuss the impact of WCAG, the basic principles of online accessibility, its design implications, and more. We're here joined by Monique Veenstra, who's a marketing technology engineer here at Red Door, as well as Ashton Taylor, our associate design director. Thanks for joining us, guys. Sure thing. Yeah. Thanks. Absolutely. Well, to set the stage for everybody here, um, you know, this is folks who are in marketing and they didn't realize that this was something that they were going to have to deal with here. What at a high level, what is the web content accessibility guidelines, WCAG, W-C-A-G? Well, I can start um, at a very broad level. It's a set of documents that explain how to make web content more accessible to people with disabilities. That's pretty straightforward. Yeah, Yeah, there you go. A lot of people have to uh, access your website, um, and some people, a lot of people don't uh, always take that into consideration. Um, I mean, and it's important to recognize what what the issues may be. So what are some of the disabilities that are covered within these guidelines? So there isn't an explicit list of disabilities that the guidelines cover. The disabilities can range from... visual to physical to speech cognitive, um, in some instances, a combination of those and much more. The main objective of the guidelines is to really create web content that is accessible to as many users as possible. Yeah, I mean, I I think that um, I I certainly can connect to it, obviously, in the sense that if you can't see it, but you still want to access all the stuff, you've got to have it read to you. Um, or if, you know, you have maybe some color issues or something like that, you got to be able to see the contrast. Um, I, I think that's a little bit of a, about what people are trying to figure out is what are the basic principles of online accessibility? Sure. So, um, the WCAG well, guidelines are categorized into four principles known as POUR, so P-O-U-R. And those principles lay the foundation necessary for creating accessible content. Each one of those principles has a set of guidelines that needs to be satisfied in order to claim conformance. Um, and so there are three levels that you can claim, level A, level A AA, and AAA. Um, and each level gets progressively harder. Is it critical, I mean, are there different brands or different kinds of companies that need to conform to one or the, like A, AA or AAA in that case? Level AA is the web standard. Okay. Um, level A is is pretty basic. A lot of people can probably do level A updates on their own, but level AA is the standard. Level AAA is the most comprehensive and the most difficult conformance level to achieve. So level AA is the standard for most industries. And from my understanding too, and Greg, you're about- Correct me if I'm wrong, Monique. The um, the AAA rating is very very difficult to achieve, so it's it's nearly impossible, which is why you know it's at such a high level. But um, it's there and does have some important principles um, within it. So. What are some of those principles? So the first principle, which is the P and poor, stands for uh, perceivable. So this basically states that the user must be able to perceive the information on the website in some way. Um, This is using one or more of their senses. So this means that we need to provide text alternatives for non-text content. It means that we need to provide captions and other alternatives for multimedia. Um, We need to create content that is presented in different ways without losing meaning. The O, which stands for operable, 
means that the user needs to be able to control the elements on the web page in some way. So we need to make sure that all of the functionality is available from a keyboard. We need to give the users enough time to read and understand the content. So instead of having these auto rotating carousels, give them the option to stop and play that at their leisure. Um, we need to make sure that we don't create content that causes seizures. What comes to mind is those animated GIFs that you know blink and just don't stop. The U stands for understandable. And this essentially, this is, this is a big one because just because your content may be perceivable and operable, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's understandable. Um, so it means that they need to understand the information as well as the operation of that content and what the intent is. Um, so making text readable and understandable, making sure that it operates in a predictable way and that it's in logical order. Um, one of the things that we can do is help users avoid and correct mistakes as they run into those sorts of things. And then the last one, which is robust, this basically says that the content needs to be developed in a way that in a way that will work across different technologies as technology as technologies change. Um, and so we can do this by using well-adopted web, web standards. Um, and just always referring back to the guidelines to make sure that we're checking everything off. Well, that, and that's awesome. And it's really detailed. I'm, I'm sure that um, a lot of people who are listening to this have to kind of, they're like, oh man, that's a lot of stuff. Um, but there's also the balance of these things. We're talking from a technical standpoint um, and then from a design standpoint. And that's why one of the things I love about the show as we do here is we tend to bring people from different disciplines, but this is a case in which you guys have to really work together to get this thing sorted out between Ashton on the design side and Monique on the tech side. Maybe talk a little bit about that, the, maybe the relationship of what you guys have to do at a, at a practical level to make this work. Right, so um, luckily Monique and I work pretty closely together on a lot of projects. So there's a lot of back and forth between us um, when we're kind of wireframing stage and things like that, building out websites. And I'd have to say that, um, you know, the guidelines are, are very useful to have there as a resource, but um, just having that direct line of communication has been huge in really kind of understanding how to kind of abide by a lot of these guidelines and um, getting the insight from the tech perspective really helps me um, on the design side to really get a grasp of the whole thing. So it's a, uh, it's very daunting when you start going through some of the um, actual technical documentation of this. Um, a lot of it isn't even uh, spelled out for people that actually build websites, but actually build browsers. So it can get very technical in nature. So. Oh, wow. yeah. Right. And just to sort of add on to that, I would say that planning for WCAG upfront in the wireframing stage is extremely important. And um, it saves a lot of time and development and testing when you plan ahead and you don't have to make changes last minute um, and possibly end up restructuring an entire page or several pages. So that you're saying that part of the planning process, we've got to start planning ahead for this stuff or else you're going to have to <laughs> redo a lot of stuff. Right. So I'm sure exactly. there's some listeners who are all of a sudden going, uh-oh. <laughs> They're in the middle of a process or project or something like that. Now, I, I'm curious actually for, for you guys now, having now been doing uh, so much of this, do you guys see the web differently? I mean, are you guys a little more sensitive to this? Oh, yeah, definitely. I think I've been heads down in WCAG for almost a year now. <laughs> it's a hard switch to turn off. Every time I see something, it just is like, oh, man, we need to fix that. Oh, <laughs> right, no. right. And so, you know, it's just, it's, ingrained in me yeah. um, and I think it's it's for the better um, because I'm able to you know easily spot things these these things out and make make recommendations yeah. right and I think um, you know we touched on the disabilities a little bit earlier but I think one thing that I've I really learned over this process is how broad the range of um, disabilities are out there and you know how many different variations there really are um, to kind of design to or code to so that's something that's uh, kind of opened my eyes a lot I'm sure that adds a little bit to the um, you know your creative I guess box that you have to get put into in some cases but I would imagine it illuminates some of your design aesthetic too it does. I mean, there are some valuable things within WCAG that are actually important for design as well and can um, add and benefit to the design process. Um, you know, just 
basic things like color contrast, which is um, something that's talked about a lot with CAG and design because you have to meet a certain contrast ratio to be um, to kind of meet level AA, for instance, to be uh, have enough contrast so that it's readable for the user. So things like that are just important principles that kind of allow you to gauge and make decisions a that are a little bit more informed. So. That's interesting. I mean, I would imagine that it just applies in the real world if you were doing something that people have to see quickly, like, you know, normal sighted people see quickly on a freeway or something like that. It might might maybe change the way you approach that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think there's also a misconception that if you have to design for accessibility, that your website's going to be ugly, which is really not true at all. Obviously, there's going to be some compromises, um, but really designing for accessibility is good for all users, users with disabilities and users that don't have disabilities. To provide some perspective, I was I was reading an article recently that said that the latest U.S. Census reported that one out of five people identify as having some type of disability. So that's 19% of the U.S. population. And that number doesn't include people that don't identify as having a disability. So that includes the aging population. It can include um, people that are facing situational constraints. Let's say you're in a really noisy environment. So you can't hear the video that you're trying to listen to. So if you have text alternatives, then you're able to consume that information. It also includes people who have temporary disabilities, such as a broken hand. And let's say someone has to operate and navigate your web page with just a keyboard for a few weeks. So if you sort of add all of those users in addition to the users with disabilities, that number is really much larger. And, and I think that that speaks to a little bit. I think people think of WCAG and then they go, oh, man, like the, you know, the risks are we get sued or we anything like that. But what you're talking about is tw conceptually 20 percent of the population becomes accessible um, to you if you comply with WCAG guidelines, which is an opportunity. It's not a penalty of some sort, um, which I, so I think hopefully and what some of the things I hope listeners do take away from this is there's a real uh, value to this aside from going, oh, man, we got to fix this. So, yeah, and I don't think, um, you know, in the design community, at least, I don't think it's been, you know, grasped very uh, quickly. So because of the detail and the nature of it, it is um, very antiquated and, and um, very robust. So it's taken a little bit of time, I think, for the design community to really take hold of it and understand the value behind it. So Yeah, I mean, you have to appreciate it. I mean, at the end of the day, you don't want to see it as a burden. You got to see it as an opportunity. And, and, and certainly, I think there's a, some the, the creative challenges I would imagine um, can be can be kind of fun. Absolutely. And I, I would argue, too, that, you know, everyone sort of felt in the de the design and tech community when responsive design came out, everyone had the same feelings. You know, it's going to be extra work. You're designing within certain limitations, but responsive design is inherently accessible as well. For for our listeners to talk, a, just <laughs> for that little sidebar, talk about what, what what's responsive design? What are you talking about there? So responsive design is designing and building a web page that responds to multiple viewports. So if your user is on a desktop, the website performs and looks great. If they're on a mobile device, it they're getting the same experience. Yeah. And I think a lot of people would always talk about it as it degrades into or whatever and use vernacular like that. And I think now it's become such a mobile first world where I think people used to think you're degrading a desktop down into mobile. And now, I mean, so much, at least half of the traffic most likely is is on mobile. And it's really you're crafting an experience for that. And, and that's the expectation. So um, it sounds like this is becoming more and more or should be become more and more the expectation as well. Right. And I think in a few years, it is going to be the new standard. Yeah. Do you think this standard will apply then globally as well? I mean, this is not just a U.S. thing, right? Absolutely. There, the book had guidelines are maintained by an international group of developers and designers. So it's not something that is specific to the U.S. It's also important to note that U.S. companies do have global audiences. And so this is going to become the mainstream at some point. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I think that, um, you know, you're, you're going to have to accommodate then uh, different languages and different requirements, probably country to country, which then brings up the subject of, of you know, I guess it makes you think of speaking. What about voice? We've talked about in, in uh, previous podcasts and content around voice first. Um, what d does voice first and how we're moving toward your Alexas and series and things like that? Does is that factored into this at all yet? 
So the, the guidelines are really meant to be technology agnostic, meaning that they provide these concepts that can be applied to any type of technology that you're using. So voice would be covered under these principles. So it's definitely something that needs to be factored into to your website. That's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't necessarily realize that they're <laughs> keeping it that flexible, but it makes sense. I guess they're, the conditions don't change. Largely, so um, just the technology, it seems to move forward. Um, and so since you guys have been spending so much time in this, and I alluded to that earlier, but what are maybe some of the stories that you had in terms of re-architecting um, some of the work we've done for so many of our clients uh, that are going through this at the moment? I think we've got caught some people on the front end where we're able to apply it as we're building, but some people we've had to kind of mitigate or, um, or fix uh, what they've got going on on their side at the moment. Right. I think some of the clients that we've had to sort of uh, provide a remediation uh, for have resulted, you know, we, we do the audit first. So we sort of try to find what are the common things that are happening that are not accessible. A lot of times it's a lot of the same things. So alt text are missing images. There's not enough color contrast between elements. Um, missing links, for example, incorrect usage of headings, too many H1s on the page. Um, so those sorts of things are a lot easier to fix. Some of the more complicated elements when there's complex functionality and third-party integrations and libraries, those tend to be a bigger level of effort and require more planning. So, you know, with those that we get to plan, I mean, obviously that makes it easier. But it seems like with some of the remediation, some of those are come under a little bit of urgency. Um, I, I know that we've uh, had clients who had to, uh, they've come to us because they've gotten a letter. Um, what, what are the risks um, that companies are facing if they haven't gone through this process? So being sued is, is obviously, yeah. that one's pretty, that's a big one. And it's happening a lot. I mean, it that's, is. It, we're seeing this stuff happen more and more. Um, so yeah, I mean, sorry, carry on. So obviously fear is a big motivator um, and you don't, people don't want to be sued and that is a risk. I mean, I think a lot of people and probably the majority of people are sort of motivated to start updating their websites to be WCAG compliant because of that. Um, and that's fine, but I think that if we can sort of realize that there are greater benefits, right. then you know maybe that motivation changes and it just sort of becomes the norm. Yeah. Yep. And just to build on that a little bit, I'd say um, even beyond the, the legal implications, I think um, it's really it can be bad press too for um, companies where they're not making their content accessible to as many people as they can. So that's just another thing that's a little bit broader, even than the legal question. Yeah. Well, you know, what, when the legal component comes into it, though, there there becomes a time pressure that they don't maybe have at the moment. So if uh, if if companies haven't uh, at least started to explore this, um, there's a point in time where they may get under some kind of a time pressure to kind of um, remediate whatever issues are. So obviously um, encouraging our clients and, and anybody out there listening to us to, to go through this process. What does that um, process really look like uh, on the front? If somebody says, hey, you know what I do? Uh, I, I want to conform to this. I'm, I'm, I'm compelled at this point. Um, what does that process look like? So from a design perspective, again, it's it's really important to get ahead of these things as quickly as you can. So um, a lot of my experience has been, um, you know, if a company comes to us and they potentially have web standard guidelines that they usually have, um, if you can take a look at those, you can begin to identify things that could be issues, like for instance, color contrast with their brand palette and things like that. And then once you identify th those things, oftentimes it's a conversation with the client on the implications and what sort of modifications can take place from there. So That's interesting. So their brand palette in and of itself could be an issue? Absolutely, because it relates to the fonts you're putting on the website and all the colors. So if they don't pass the contrast test, which a great yeah, a great lot of them do. I'd say at least half, if not more. Um, then you know you have to have that conversation and understand uh, the implications. There went the brand book. All <laughs> that time. The good news is that your logos logos are exempt from that guideline. Oh, so, there you go. Yeah, so at least there's something can be <laughs> yeah. salvaged. Um, but again, actually, you go back to the opportunity there. That means that if your logo had an issue with it, though, then there are is an audience there that's probably struggling with it. So that's Absolutely. interesting. Absolutely. Yep. I think from a development standpoint, you know, after collaborating with the designer and sort of coming to a, a design that 
meets level AA or whatever level we're trying to target, when we start to develop, one of the key aspects is to make sure that we're testing often and early. Um, there are automated tools that are really great for helping catch some of these upfront issues like alt text messaging, missing on images, um, color contrast ratio issues. But the one thing I will say is that those automated tools should never be used in isolation. We should be manual manually testing with different types of technologies and preferably a person with a disability would be also testing your website because only a human can really determine true accessibility. So these tools are great, um, but really at the end of the day, accessibility is very subjective. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, those are good tips. I think it's um, you know something that, that companies as they're going through the process of, of redoing their site or something like that need to um, explore within their contract with whoever's doing it or internal resource to make sure that this is a part of it. Um, and then take it to whatever degree is appropriate. And, and what you guys have said is that AAA rating is is pretty hard, but at least AA, um, and ha making sure that they're, whoever's doing it understands uh, what those benchmarks are, and I think we're trying to help them here. Um, so really appreciate you guys joining us on the show. Um, we are going to do, because I, there's a lot covered here, yeah. uh, there's the acronym and a lot of details in there, so we're helping people out as well beyond the podcast uh, we've got a full uh, POV point of view on WCAG at reddoor.biz slash learn that our team has put together to be helpful to uh, the audience out there. And the expectation here is that, you know, people with disabilities will be able to access all of that content, uh, just fine, appropriate contrast and the like. So uh, thank you guys for joining us and, and uh, doing what you do. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thanks.